Lord Russell, what is philosophy? Well, that's a very controversial question. I think no two philosophers will give you the same answer. My own view would be that uh, philosophy consists of uh, speculations about matters where exact knowledge is not yet possible. But that will never be my answer, not anybody else's. What's the difference between philosophy and science? <laughs> well, roughly you'd say science is what we know and philosophy is what we don't know. That's a simple definition. And for that reason, uh, Christians are perpetually passing over from philosophy into science as knowledge advances. Well, when something is established and discovered, it ceases to be philosophy and becomes science. Yes. And uh, all sorts of questions that uh, used to be labelled philosophy uh, are no longer so labelled. Well, what good is philosophy? I think uh, philosophy has two uses, really. Uh, one of them is to keep alive speculation about things that are not yet amenable to scientific knowledge. After all, scientific knowledge covers a very small part of uh, the things that interest mankind and ought to interest them. There are a great many things of immense interest about which science at present at any rate has nothing to say. And I don't want people's imaginations to be limited and enclosed within what can be now known. And I think to enlarge your imaginative purview of the world into the hypothetical realm is one of the uses of philosophy. But uh, there's another use which I think is equally important, uh, which is to show that there are things we thought we knew and don't know. On the one hand, to keep us thinking about things that we may come to know, and on the other hand, to keep us modestly aware of how much that seemed like knowledge isn't knowledge. Could you give some illustrations of the sort of subjects which have been speculated about and then to produce the material result later? Yes, uh, it's quite easy to do so, uh, especially from Greek philosophy. The Greeks invented a whole lot of hypotheses which turned out valuable later, but which in their day couldn't be tested. Take, for example, the atomic hypothesis. Uh, Democritus invented the atomic hypothesis that matter consists of little atoms. And uh, after about 2,000 years, and rather more than that, it turned out that this was the, the right scientific view. But in his day, it was merely a suggestion. Or uh, take again uh, Aristarchus. Aristarchus was the first person who suggested that uh, the Earth went round the Sun and not the Sun round the Earth and that the apparent uh, revolution of the heavens every day was due to the earth rotating. And uh, that remained uh, an almost buried and forgotten hypothesis until the time of Copernicus, 2,000 years later. But Copernicus would probably never have thought of it if it hadn't been for Aristarchus. How is this done? By some sort of intuition? Oh, no, because uh, the people who first think of these hypotheses can't say this is the truth. They only say this may be the truth. And uh, if you have a good scientific imagination, you can uh, think of all sorts of things that might be true. And uh, that's the, the essence of uh, science. You first think of something that might be true, and then you look to see whether it is, and generally it isn't. But didn't, didn't Plato think that democracies oughtn't to be speculating in this way at all? Oh, yes. It? Plato was horrified by him. He said all his books ought to be burnt. Because Plato didn't like science. He liked mathematics, but he didn't like anything else that was scientific. Now, in this way, philosophy, in a sense, becomes a kind of servant of science. Well, that's part of it. But, uh, of course, it isn't only a servant of science. Because uh, there are a number of things that science can't deal with. All questions of values, for example. Uh, science won't tell you what is good and what is bad. Uh, tell you what is good or bad uh, as an end, not as, just as a means. But what change has there been over the years in the attitude of philosophers and the public to philosophy, would you say? 
Well, that depends upon the school of philosophy that you're thinking of. Uh, in uh, Plato and in Aristotle, in both of them, there was uh, the main thing was an attempt to understand the world. And that, I should say, personally, is what philosophy ought to be doing. But uh, then you come on to the Stoics, and their emphasis was mainly on, on morality. That uh, you ought to be stoical, you ought to endure misfortunes patiently. And uh, that came to be the popular use of a philosopher. Would you say that Marx was a philosopher? <laughs> well, he, he was in, certainly in a sense a philosopher. But now there you have an important division among philosophers. There are some philosophers who exist to uphold the status quo and others who exist to upset it. And Marx, of course, belongs to the second lot. But for my part, I should reject both those as being not the true business of a philosopher. And I should say the business of a philosopher is not to change the world, but to understand it, which is the exact opposite of what Marx said. What kind of a philosopher would you say that you are? Well, uh, the only label I've ever given myself is logical atomist. But I'm not very keen on the label. I've rather avoided labels. It means, in my mind, that uh, the way to get at uh, the nature of any subject matter you're looking at is analysis. And that uh, you can analyze until you get to things that uh, can't be analyzed any further. And those would be logical atoms. I call them logical atoms because they're not little bits of matter. They're uh, the, so to speak, ideas out of which a thing is built up. What is the main trend of philosophy today? In uh, what I was saying a moment ago, it would appear that uh, philosophy is merely incomplete science. And uh, there are people who don't like that view. They want to have science have a sphere, uh, philosophy have a sphere to itself. Uh, that has led them into what you may call linguistic philosophy that the important thing for the philosopher is not to answer questions, but to get the meaning of the questions quite clear. I can't myself agree to that view, but uh, I could give an illustration. I was once uh, bicycling to Winchester, and I lost my way, and uh, I went to a village shop, and I said, uh, can you tell me the shortest way to Winchester? And the man I asked uh, called to a man in a back region whom I couldn't see. Gentleman wants to know the shortest way to Winchester. And the voice came back, Winchester? Aye. Way to Winchester? Aye. Shortest way? Aye. Don't know. <laughs> and so I had to go on without getting an answer. Well, uh, that is what uh, Oxford philosophy thinks one should do. The continental approach is, uh, well, it's more full-blooded. I, I don't agree with it anymore, but uh, in a sense it's much more full-blooded and much more like philosophies of earlier times. There are various uh, kinds. There's the philosophy that uh, comes from Kierkegaard, existentialism, and then there's, there are philosophies uh, designed to uh, provide apologetics for traditional religion. There are various uh, things of that sort. I don't think myself that there's anything very important in all that. But now what practical use is your sort of philosophy to a man who wants to know how to conduct himself? Well, I find it useful because I get letters very often from people saying I'm completely perplexed. I don't know what to do. And uh, I can't see a reason for doing this rather than that. Well, uh, I say to these people, now, uh, this world is not one in which certainty is possible. If you think you've achieved certainty, you're almost certainly mistaken. <laughs> That's one of the few things you can be certain about. And therefore, you have to learn to act upon something that you still more or less doubt. You have to learn to act on probability. After all, there's nothing very new about that. Suppose you're a general preparing a plan for a battle... You don't know exactly what the enemy will do. You guess. And if you're a good general, you guess right. If you're a bad general, you guess wrong. Uh, but uh, one has, in practical life, to act upon probabilities. 
And what I should look to philosophy to do is to encourage people to act with vigor, without complete certainty. Yes, but now, how about this business, though, of um, making people so uncertain about things they sort of believe and have faith in? Uh, doesn't that rather disturb them? Well, it does for a time, of course. Uh, and I think a certain amount of disturbance is an essential part of, of, of mental training. But uh, if they have any knowledge of science, they get a ballast which enables them to avoid being completely upset by the doubts that they ought to feel. So what sort of future would you think that philosophy has got? I mean, is it going to run out? Yes, I, I don't think philosophy can in the future have anything like the importance that it had either to the Greeks or in the Middle Ages. I think the rise of science inevitably diminishes the importance of philosophy. But now, how would you then summarize the value of philosophy uh, in the present world and in the future? Well, I think it's very important in the present world. First, because, as I say, it, it keeps you realizing that there are very big and very important questions that science at any rate at present can't deal with and that a, a, a scientific attitude by itself is not adequate. And the second thing it does is to make people a little more modest intellectually and aware that a great many things which have been thought certain turned out to be untrue and that uh, there's no shortcut to uh, knowledge and that the understanding of the world which to my mind is the underlying purpose that every philosopher should have that that is a very long and difficult business about which we ought not to be dogmatic 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 have you ever had religious impulses Lord Russell? Oh, yes. When I was adolescent, I was deeply religious. I was more interested in religion than in anything else, except perhaps mathematics. And uh, being interested in religion led me, which it doesn't seem often to do, to look into the question whether there was reason to believe it. I took up three questions. It seemed to me that God and immortality and free will were the three most essential questions. And I examined these uh, one by one in the reverse order, beginning with free will. And uh, gradually I came to the conclusion that there was no reason to believe any of these. And uh, that uh, I thought I was going to be very disappointed, but oddly enough I wasn't. But how did you come to convince yourself that there was no reason to believe in any of these three things? Well, uh, over free will, I think the argument was not a valid one. Uh, and I don't any longer think it was at all conclusive. But I thought that because I thought that uh, all the motions of matter are uh, determined by the laws of dynamics. And the motion of a man's lips when he speaks must be so determined so that he can have no control over what he's going to say. I don't think that was a valid argument, but that convinced me at that time about immortality uh, well it seemed to me quite clear uh, that uh, the uh, relation of body and mind whatever it may be is much more intimate uh, than is commonly supposed and uh, that uh, there's no reason to think that uh, a mind persists when a brain decays and as for God well there are a great many arguments that have been advanced in favor of the existence of God. And uh, one and all, I thought, and still think, that they're invalid, and that nobody would have accepted such arguments if they hadn't wanted to believe the conclusion. Do you think that it is certain that there is no such thing as God, or simply that it is not proven? 
I don't think it is certain that there is no such thing. No, I think uh, that it is on exactly the same level as the Olympic gods or the Norwegian gods. They also may exist, the gods of Olympus and the gods of Valhalla. I can't prove they don't. But I think the Christian god has no more likelihood than they have. I think they're a bare possibility. Do you think that religion is good or harmful in its effects? I think most of its effects in history have been harmful. Not all. Uh, religion uh, caused the Egyptian priests to uh, fix the calendar and uh, to note the occurrence of eclipses so well that in time they were able to predict them. I think those were beneficial effects of religion. But I think uh, great majority have been bad. And I think they've been bad because it was held important that people should believe something for which there did not exist good evidence. And that falsified everybody's thinking, falsified systems of education, and set up also what I think a complete moral heresy, namely that it is right to believe certain things and wrong to believe certain others, apart from the question whether the things in question are true or false. But do you mean there's a kind of censorship of thought that goes on, which prevents free thinking? I do, yes. I mean, uh, if you take uh, practically any school in the world, uh, any uh, school for boys and girls, you will find uh, that... Uh, a certain kind of belief is taught. It's one sort in Christian countries and another in communist countries. But in both, something is taught. And the evidence for what is taught is not impartially examined. And the children are not encouraged to find out what there is to say on the other side. Well, what is it that makes man over the centuries demand a religion? I think uh, mainly fear. Man uh, feels himself rather powerless. Uh, there are three things that cause him fear. One is what nature can do to him. It can strike him by lightning or swallow him up in an earthquake. One is what other men can do, which is that they can kill him in war. And the third, which has a great deal to do with religion, is what his own violent passions may lead him to do. The things which he knows in a calm moment he would regret having done. And uh, for that reason, most people have a great deal of fear in their lives. And uh, religion helps them to be not so frightened by these fears. But, but the founders of religions, I say religions in the plural, have very little to do with what their followers teach. Very little indeed. I... Uh, well, uh, to take an illustration, I've uh, found that uh, uh, military men in this country uh, think that uh, Christian belief is uh, very important in uh, the contest with uh, Eastern powers. And uh, they think that uh, if you're not a Christian, you won't be so vigorous about it. Well, uh, I read the Sermon on the Mount over again, and I couldn't find a word in it to encourage H-bombs. Not a word. Much of what you're criticizing happened a long time ago, but what about today? Oh, no, it's just the same today. Uh, this illustration I gave you about the H-bombs is certainly not antiquated yet. I wish it were. Uh, and I think that at this present day, uh, religion as embodied in the churches, in the main, uh, discourages honest thinking and uh, gives importance to things that are not very important. Its sense of importance seems to be quite wrong. Nay, now, when uh, the Roman Empire was falling, the fathers of the church uh, didn't bother much with the fall of the Roman Empire what they bothered with was how to preserve virginity. That was what they thought important. 
Well, now... What do they, they do about that? Sir? Well, they exhorted people and uh, uh, didn't bother about uh, seeing that the armies held the frontiers or anything like that, or that the taxation system was reformed. Uh, they were uh, occupied in founding monasteries and nunneries and so forth, and thought that far more important than preserving the empire. Well, so in the present day, when uh, the human race is falling, I find uh, that uh, eminent divines think uh, that uh, it's much more important to prevent artificial insemination uh, than it is to uh, prevent uh, the kind of world war that will exterminate the whole lot of us. And that seems to me to show a lack of sense of proportion. Yes, wouldn't you agree there that Many organized religions have done a tremendous amount of good in spreading education where perhaps no other system has been available, as in Burma, say, where the monks have done a tremendous amount of educating the poor, where there aren't any organized schools. Well, I think it's possible, yes, and I, I think the, the Benedictines did a certain amount of good in that way. But only after doing the harm, they first did a great deal of harm, and then a little good. But then what about people, though, who feel that they must have some faith in a religion, otherwise they can't face their life at all? Well, you I take that away. That, I say people who feel that are uh, really... Uh, well, uh, they're showing a kind of cowardice, which in any other sphere would be considered contemptible. But when it's in the religious sphere, it's thought admirable. And I can't admire cowardice, whatever sphere it's in. Now, I take uh, the whole uh, question of the uh, very dangerous condition that the world is in. Uh, I get letters constantly from people saying, oh, God will look after it. But he never has in the past. I don't know why they should think he will in the future. You will think this is a very unwise doctrine to follow. It ought to be self-help rather than depending on somebody else to do it for you. Certainly, yes. But then if uh, a religion is harmful, and yet man has always insisted on having one, what is the answer? Oh, man hasn't. Uh, some men have, and those are the men who are used to it. Uh, in countries in the land, for instance, people walk on stilts, and they don't like walking without stilts. And religion is just the same thing. Some countries have got accustomed to it. But uh, now, I spent a year in China, and I found that the ordinary, average Chinese had no religion whatsoever, and uh, they were just as happy, I think, given their bad circumstances, happier than most Christians would have been. But I think a Christian would say that if he could convert them into being Christians, they'd be much happier. Well, I don't think that's borne out by the evidence at all. Yes, but doesn't man rather search for some cause or faith outside himself, which appears to be bigger than himself, not merely a question of cowardice or leaning on it, but also wanting to do something for it. Well, but there are plenty of things bigger than oneself. I mean, uh, from you start, uh, first of all, there's your family, then there's your nation, then there's mankind in general. And those are all bigger than oneself and are uh, quite sufficient to occupy any genuine feelings of benevolence that a man may have. Do you think that organized religion is going to go on having the same grip on mankind? I think it depends entirely upon whether people solve their social problems or not. Uh, I think that uh, if there go on being great wars and great oppressions and uh, many people leading very unhappy lives, probably religion will go on because I've observed that uh, the belief in the goodness of God is inversely proportional to the evidence. When there's no evidence for it at all, people believe it. And when things are going well and you might believe it, they don't. So I think that if uh, people solve their social problems, religion will die out. But on the other hand, if they don't, I don't think it will. Now you can get illustrations of that in the past. In the 18th century, when things were quiet, a great many educated people were free thinkers. Well, then came the French Revolution, and certainly English aristocrats came to the conclusion that uh, free thought led to the guillotine, and so they dropped it, and they all became deeply religious, and you got Victorianism. And uh, the same thing again happened with the Russian Revolution. 
the Russian Revolution terrified people, and they thought uh, that uh, unless they believed in God, their property would be confiscated. So they believed in him. So that I think you'll find that uh, these social upheavals are very good for religion. But do you think that you and I are going to be just snuffed out completely when we die? Certainly, yes. I don't see why you... What, I mean, I know that the body disintegrates, and uh, I think that uh, there's no reason whatever to suppose that uh, the mind goes on when the body is disintegrated. 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 Lord Russell, what do you mean by taboo morality? Well, I mean the sort of morality that consists in giving a set of rules mainly as to things you must not do, without giving any reasons for those rules. And sometimes uh, no reasons could be found, other times they could. But in any case, the rules are considered absolute. Uh, these things you must not do. What sort of things? Well, now, uh, it depends on the level of civilization. Taboo morality is the primitive kind. It uh, uh, is the only kind, I think, in primitive tribes. Where, for example, it would be a rule, you must not eat out of one of the chief's dishes. Uh, if you do, you will probably die, so they say. And uh, there are all sorts of rules of that sort. I remember the king of Tahomey had a rule that he must not look long in any one direction, because if he did, there would be tempests in that part of his dominions. And so there was a, a, a rule, he must always be looking round. But... Uh, those are sort of taboos from what we, I suppose, consider primitive societies. What about our own? Well, our own uh, morality is just as full of taboos. There are lots of things, uh, well, uh, even in the most august things. Now, there is one uh, sin definitely recognized to be a sin, which I have never committed. It says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ox. Now, I never have. But uh, I don't uh, quite see what harm I should do if I did. Yes, but what about more sort of matter of fact or everyday rules than that? Are there, are there examples of, of taboo morality? Oh, yes. And, of course, a great deal of taboo morality is entirely compatible with what one might call rational morality. Uh, for instance, that you shouldn't steal or you shouldn't murder. Uh, those are uh, precepts that are entirely in accord with reason. But they are set forth as taboos. And when they're set forth as taboos, they have consequences that they ought not to have. For instance, in the case of murder, it's considered that it forbids euthanasia, which I think a rational person would be in favor of. But do you put in the, in the category of taboo morality things like um, Hindus saying you shouldn't eat beef? Yes, those are typical things of Hindu morality. The uh, Hindu says you shouldn't eat beef. The uh, Mohammedan and the Jew says you mustn't eat pork. And uh, there's no reason for that. It's just a, a taboo. But you don't think these taboos serve any useful purpose? Some do and some don't. It all depends. I mean, uh, if you get a rational basis for your ethic, you can then look into the taboos and see which are useful. But the prohibition of beef, I should say, it doesn't do any good at all. It only means that uh, a large number of cattle have to die very painful deaths. Now, if you don't believe in religion, and you don't, and if you don't, on the whole, think much of the assorted rules thrown up by taboo morality, do you believe in any system of ethics? Yes, but it's very difficult to separate ethics altogether from politics. Uh, ethics, it seems to me, arises in this way. Uh, a man is inclined to do something which benefits him and harms his neighbor. Well, uh, if it harms a good many of his neighbors, they will uh, combine together and say, look, uh, we don't like this sort of thing. We will see to it that it doesn't benefit the man. And that leads to the criminal law, which is uh, perfectly rational. It's a method of harmonizing the general and private interest. But now, isn't it, though, rather inconvenient if everybody goes about uh, with his own kind of private system of ethics instead of accepting a general one? 
It would be, if that were so, but in fact, they're not so private as all that, because, as I was saying a moment ago, they get embodied in the criminal law, and apart from the criminal law, in public approval and disapproval. People don't like to incur public disapproval. And in that way, the accepted code of morality becomes a very potent thing. But is there such a thing as sin? No, I, I think sin, it's difficult to define. If you mean merely undesirable actions, of course there are undesirable actions. And when I say undesirable, I mean that there are actions which, on the balance, do more harm than good. And of course there are. But I don't think sin is a useful conception. I think sin, uh, the essence of what people mean when they talk of sin, is that it is a positive good to punish the man who does this sort of thing. That you should punish murderers not only because you want to prevent murder, but because the murderer deserves to suffer. But are you saying that sin is really an excuse for cruelty in many cases? I think very largely. I mean, I think only cruel people could have invented hell. People with humane feelings would not have liked the thought that those who do on earth things which are condemned by the morality of their tribe will suffer eternally without any chance of amendment. I don't think decent people would have ever adopted that view. But you mean the concept of sin is really a chance to get one's aggressive feelings out? Yes, I think so. It's uh, the essence of uh, what you might call a stern morality is uh, to enable you to inflict suffering without a bad conscience. And therefore I think it's a bad thing. But then how are we to disapprove of things if we don't accept the proposition that there is such a thing as a sin? Well, uh, the disapproval in itself, uh, combined with the criminal law, it does, I think, all that you can do. Uh, you have to have a certain kind of public opinion. Now, you will see how important that is if you read uh, the histories of the Italian Renaissance, the sort of histories that produced uh, uh, Machiavelli's theories, where uh, public opinion tolerated things which, uh, in most times, public opinion would not tolerate. Would you agree, though, that some things are wicked? I shouldn't like to use that word. I should say some things do more harm than good. And uh, if you know that they're going to do more harm than good, uh, well, uh, you better not do them. And if you like to use the word wicked, you can, but I don't think it's a useful word. Uh, a large part of uh, taboo morality affects sexual relations and a good deal of your writings has been devoted to this particular problem. How would you say that people who want to live sensibly so far as sex is concerned, how should they conduct themselves? Well, I should like first to say by way of preface that uh, only about 1% of my writings is concerned with sex. But uh, the conventional public is so obsessed with sex that it hasn't noticed the other 99% of my writings. I should like to say that to begin with, and I think 1% is a reasonable proportion of human interest to assign to that subject. But um, I should deal with sexual morality exactly as I should with everything else. I should say, if what you're doing does no harm to anybody, there's no reason to condemn it. And uh, you shouldn't condemn it merely because some uh, ancient taboo has said that this is wrong. You should look into whether it does any harm or not. And uh, that's uh, the basis of sexual morality as of all other. Would you say then that rape is to be condemned, but ordinary fornication, provided that it didn't hurt anybody, is not necessarily to be condemned? Uh, yes, I should certainly say that uh, rape is just like any other uh, bodily violence. Uh, as for fornication, well, you'd have to look into the circumstances to see whether there was on this occasion a reason against it or whether there wasn't. 
but not to block condemnation always and under all circumstances. Uh, do you think that it's um, right to have rules about what can and can't be published? Well, uh, that's a question on which I feel uh, rather an extreme position, a, a position that I'm afraid very few people agree with. I think there ought to be no rules whatever prohibiting uh, improper publications. I think that uh, partly because if there are any rules, stupid magistrates will condemn really valuable work because it happens to shock them. That's one of the reasons. The other reason is that I think prohibitions immensely increase people's interest in uh, pornography as in anything else. Uh, I used often to go to America during Prohibition, and there was far more uh, drunkenness than there was before, far more. And I think the Prohibition of Pornography has much the same effect. Now, i give you an illustration of what I mean about Prohibitions. The philosopher Empedocles thought it was very, very wicked to munch laurel leaves, and he laments that he will have to spend 10,000 years in outer darkness because he'd munched laurel leaves. Now, nobody's ever told me not to munch laurel leaves, and I've never done it. But Empedocles, who was told not to, did do it. And I think the same applies to pornography. But do you think, then, that if everything that anybody wanted to write of an obscene nature were to be published, this, in fact, would not increase people's interest at all? I think it would diminish it. I think, uh, suppose, for instance, uh, filthy postcards were permitted. I think for the first year or two, there would be a great demand for them, and then people would get bored and nobody would look at them again. And this would apply to writings and so on as well? I think so, uh, within the limits of what is sensible. I mean, if it was a fine piece of art, a fine piece of work, the people would read it, but not to, because it was pornographic. To come back to the basis of what we've been talking about, the unthinking rules of taboo morality, what harm do you think they do? Well, they do two different sorts of harm. Let's say those of them which are not rationally justifiable. One sort of harm is that they are usually ancient and come down from a different sort of society from that in which we live where really a different ethic was appropriate, and very often they're not at all appropriate to modern times. Uh, I think that applies in particular to artificial insemination, which is a thing that uh, the moralists of the past hadn't thought of, and uh, there was no provision for it in their morality. That's one sort of thing. Another is that uh, they tend to perpetuate ancient cruelties. Now, I could give several examples of that. Uh, take, for instance, human sacrifice. Uh, the Greeks, at a very early period in their history, began to turn against human sacrifice, which they had practiced. And uh, they wanted to abolish it. But uh, there was one institution which didn't want it abolished and stuck up for it through thick and thin, and that was the Oracle at Delphi. It made its living out of superstition, and it didn't want superstition diminished. And so it stood up for human sacrifice long after other Greeks had given it up. That's one example. Now, I could give you another example, which really was of some importance. It had always been held that to cut up a corpse was extraordinarily wicked. Uh, Vesalius, who was a very eminent uh, doctor in the time of the Emperor Charles V, uh, realized that you couldn't uh, uh, really do a great many valuable medical things unless you dissected corpses. And so he used to dissect corpses. Now, the Emperor Charles V was a valetudinarian and thought this was the only doctor who would keep him well. So he protected him. But after the Emperor had abdicated, uh, there was nobody to protect him. And uh, he was condemned for having dissected a body which they said was not quite dead and it was condemned as a penalty to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land 
On the way, he got shipwrecked and died of hardship, and that was the end of him. And all this because there was this taboo against cutting up corpses. But what harm do you think taboo morality is doing today? And if it is doing it today, what ought we to do about it? Uh, well, it certainly is doing harm today. Mm, uh, take, uh, for example, the question of birth control. There's uh, a very powerful taboo by uh, certain sections of the community which is calculated to do very enormous harm, very enormous harm. It is calculated to uh, promote poverty and war and uh, to make the solution of many social problems impossible. Uh, that's, uh, I think, perhaps the most important. Then I think there are a number of others about, well, the indissolubility of marriage. There are all sorts of taboos of that sort that seem to me to be quite definitely harmful and to be based solely upon ancient tradition and not upon an examination of present circumstances and circumstances and circumstances and circumstances. Lord Russell, what is your definition of fanaticism? I should say that uh, fanaticism consists in thinking some one matter so overwhelmingly important that it outweighs everything else at all. To take an example, and I suppose all decent people dislike cruelty to dogs, but if you thought that cruelty to dogs was so atrocious that no other cruelty should be objected to in comparison, then you would be a fanatic. But do you think this has happened a great deal in human history, that large groups of people have been seized with fanaticism? Yes, it's happened at most periods in most parts of the world. It's one of the diseases of the mind to which communities are subject. Which would you say were some of the worst occasions? There have been various occasions one could mention. Take anti-Semitism, that is one of the most dreadful, because that's the worst manifestations of that are recent and uh, we're so dreadful one can hardly bear to think of them well that uh, I know it isn't the right thing to say it isn't considered the right thing to say but anti-Semitism mainly came in with Christianity before that there was very very much less but the moment the Roman government became Christian it began to be anti-Semitic. Why was that? And because they said that uh, the Jews killed Christ, and so it gave them a justification for hating the Jews. I've no doubt there really were economic motives, but uh, that was the justification. But why do you think people do get seized in large numbers with fanaticism? Well, it's partly that uh, it gives you a cozy feeling of cooperation. A fanatical group altogether have a comfortable feeling that they're all friends of each other. Uh, they're all very much excited about the same thing. Uh, you can see it in any uh, uh, political party. There's always a fringe of fanatics in any political party. And they feel awfully cozy with each other. And when that is spread about and is combined with a propensity to hate some other group, uh, you get uh, fanaticism well developed. But might not fanaticism at times provide a kind of mainspring for good actions? It provides a mainspring for actions, all right, but I can't think of any instance in history where it's provided a mainspring for good actions. Always, I think, for bad ones. Because it is partial, because it almost inevitably involves some kind of hatred. You hate the people who don't share your fanaticism. It's uh, almost inevitable. But then if it gets taken over by uh, economic considerations, say that like the Crusades, then fanaticism disappears and perhaps does no harm. Well, I don't know. I, I can't uh, think of any good that the Crusades did. The Crusades had, of course, two uh, different streams in them a fanatical stream and an economic stream. The economic thing was very strong indeed, but it wouldn't have worked without the fanaticism. The fanaticism provided the troops and the economic motive the generals. 
<laughs> roughly speaking. <laughs> but what part would you say that witchcraft has played in fanaticism? Oh, uh, witchcraft played a terrible, terrible part, especially uh, from uh, oh, from about 1450 to about uh, 1600, a little longer than 1600. Uh, quite terrible part. There was a work called uh, The Hammer of Female Malefactors, which was uh, written by an eminent ecclesiastic and uh, inspired uh, the most mad profusion of uh, witch hunts, which uh, the people themselves believed. Uh, I think it's very likely that Joan of Arc believed she was a witch. Certainly a great many people condemned as witches did believe they were witches. And uh, there was an enormous spread of cruelty. Now, uh, Sir Thomas Brown, you would say, when you read his works, he seems like a very humane and cultivated person. But he uh, actually took part in the trials of witches on the side of the prosecution, and he said that... Uh, to deny witchcraft is a form of atheism because after all the Bible says thou shalt not suffer a witch to live and therefore if you don't think it's right to burn them if you think witches you must be disbelieving in the Bible and therefore be an atheist but how is it that quite sane people on the surface at any rate can be fanatical well sanity is a relative term uh, very, very few people are sane all through. Almost everybody has corners where they're mad. I remember once I was uh, motoring in California on a very, very wet day, and we picked up a pedestrian who was getting wet through, and he inveighed against uh, all kinds of race prejudice. He said it was the most dreadful thing, and I entirely agreed with him. And then somebody mentioned the Philippines, and he said, all Filipinos are vile. <laughs> well, you see, he had that little corner of insanity. But why do you attach so much importance to the subject of fanaticism? Because a very great part of the evils that the world is suffering are due to fanaticism. A very, very great part. Uh, always has been so, and it's worse in the present day than it's ever been before. I don't think fanaticism is more prevalent, but it is doing more harm than it has ever done before in human history. Well, can you elaborate that a bit? Yes, certainly. It deserves to be elaborated. I think that the East-West tension, which is threatening us all in the most terrible fashion, is mainly due to fanatical belief in communism or anti-communism, as the case may be. Both sides believe their own creed too strongly. They believe it in the way that I defined as fanatical, that they think that is to say that the prevention of what they regard as wicked on the other side is more important, even in the continued existence of the human race, and that is fanatical. And it is that fanaticism which is threatening us all, a fanaticism which exists on both sides. What's your definition of toleration? A toleration uh, consists, uh, well, it varies according to what direction you're thinking. Toleration of opinion, uh, if it's really full-blown, consists in not punishing any kind of opinion as long as it doesn't, doesn't issue in some kind of criminal action. And uh, toleration of opinion is the first form of toleration that arises. Well, can you uh, give some illustrations of periods in history which have been tolerant? Yes, and it really does begin with the end of the Thirty Years' War. Mm, it uh, didn't begin in England until a little later because we were in the middle of our civil war at that time. But it began really soon after that. And uh, uh, the first really tolerant state was Holland. Uh, all the leading intellects of the 17th century at some period of their lives had to take refuge in Holland. And uh, if there hadn't been Holland, they'd have been wiped out. Uh, the 
English were no better than other people at that time, there was uh, a parliamentary investigation which uh, decided that Hobbes was very, very wicked. And uh, it was decreed that no work by Hobbes was to be published in England. And it wasn't until a long, long time. Would you say that ancient Athens was a tolerant state? It was more or less tolerant. It was uh, more tolerant than modern states were until the 18th century. But it was not, of course, completely tolerant. Uh, Everybody knows about Socrates being put to death. And uh, apart from him, there were uh, other people. Uh, Anaxagoras had to fly. Uh, Aristotle had to fly after the death of Alexander. They were not wholly tolerant by any means. But how is one to know when one's got to a tolerant period? I mean, how does one recognize this? Oh, you recognize it by the the liberal freedoms. Uh, Free press, free thought, uh, free mm, propaganda, uh, freedom to read what you like, uh, freedom to uh, have whatever religion you like or lack of religion. But now, pretty well in the West, this exists today, and yet you were saying just now that we've never been in a period where there was more fanaticism. Well, I don't think it's true that it exists. Uh, I mean, uh, take, for instance, what they did in America, which was to go through all public libraries, and any book that gave any information about Russia was destroyed. And uh, you can't call that uh, exactly tolerant. If you're not enthusiastic, you don't get things done. But if you're over-enthusiastic, you run the danger of becoming fanatical. Well, now, how do you make certain that what you're doing is all right and you haven't become uh, in a, a fanatical state? Certainty is not ascertainable. But uh, what you can do, I think, is this. You can make it a principle that you will only act upon what you think is probably true if it would be utterly disastrous if you were mistaken, then it is better to withhold action. I should apply that, for instance, to burning people at the stake. I think uh, if uh, the received theology of the ages of persecution had been completely true, it would have been a good act to burn heretics at the stake. But if there's the slightest little chance that it's not true, then you're doing a bad thing. And so I think that's the sort of principle on which you've got to go. Would this apply to political parties and governments? Oh, certainly it would. I mean, uh, everybody who belongs to a political party thinks the other party's in the wrong. But uh, he wouldn't say, therefore you have a right to go and assassinate them. uh, There are certain things you may do when you think a party's in the wrong, certain things you may But what do you think of the limits of toleration? I mean, you can get into a situation where you have complete license and chaos. Well, the general principle there is that uh, people should be allowed to advocate any change in the law that they like. But in general, though I don't say this always by any means, in general, you should not permit the agitation for a definitely illegal action prior to a change in the law. You may advocate a change in the law, but you shouldn't advocate an act which is illegal while the law stands as it is. I don't say this as an absolute principle, but usually, principle, but usually, principle, but usually.